sisters, and of course, particularly those respected leaders. Uh, indeed, I'm very happy to uh, uh, come here to participate in uh, uh, this function. So I'm very happy. And now I remember Pram Hinkasa. Kartikayan. What do you want to call? Kartikayan. I know it's since many years. So one time in Delhi, I think, Kasa Jiri, Kasa, what did you say? I think Taj. Hmm? I met. Then he mentioned about this, this was the function, and he wanted me to participate. Uh, that date, as he explained, you see, my visit to America already you see, several months ago is fixed. So, but somehow you see, we arranged that. So, I'm very happy. Now, I think some of you may know. I don't like formality. Uh, and I think we should think the reality. Uh, and then also, of course, I am Buddhist. I also pray in my daily sort of meditation. But I don't believe the prayer alone can bring peace or sort of better world. No. I think it last a thousand years, at least, I think, uh, three, four thousand years on this planet, many parts of the world, many people pray, but fail. <laughs> so they ultimately, peace depends on our action. In Sanskrit word, you know, karma, karma. Uh, from the Buddhist viewpoint, law of causality. Uh, so we whole world, whole planet, whole galaxies, they moving according to the law of causality. Of course, that's from Buddhist viewpoint. Uh, so uh, cause and effect. Cause here, one major cause is human action. Uh, human action come from human motivation human thought. So you see, you're the word, happy thought. It's a very right word. Uh, happy thought not come uh, easily. <laughs> because, you see, thought or mind does its own world. So many thoughts, so many emotions. All these emotions and thoughts, uh, including wisdoms, including compassion, all these are part of our mind, part of thought. So all these, I think thousands, thousands of different minds, different views, different thoughts interconnected. So the in order to develop happy thought, not through just prayer or even meditation. Just meditation, usually you see people get the impression. Meditation means uh, close your eye and try to maintain some kind of thoughtlessness. That kind of meditation, just a mere samadhi, may not bring happy thought. During, this, during the meditation, maybe a short while, some kind of peace or tranquility. But after that meditation, when we, real, when we face the reality, problems always remain. <laughs> so therefore, you see, uh, the real sort of how say, the happy thought comes, combination, wisdom, or using human intelligence, and combined with human warm-heartedness, through that way, we can develop happy thought. So it is not easy. 
So we must utilize human intelligence, human awareness. Now here, irrespective of whether believer or non-believer, we all, nearly now 7 billion human beings, all have same potential to analyze the reality. Now reality now, peace, harmony, brings happiness. Quarrel, fighting, killing, cheating, bullying, exploiting, brings fear. Fear brings distrust. Distrust eventually brings frustration. Frustration brings anger. Anger brings violence. So now here, now I want to, 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 to tell my Indian friend, this country, Bharat, last, I think, two, two three thousand years, the concept of ahimsa developed and practiced through generations. Even today, compare neighboring states this country, in spite of many difficulties, many problems, still comparatively more stable, more peaceful. As far as democracy is concerned, in this country, in spite of some petty politicians, <laughs> but still basically very sound. All these come from India's thousand-year-old tradition, tradition of Ahimsa. There are different views, but respect each other. One time, Advani told me one of the reasons for the successful democracy, democratic practice in this country is that thousand years in this country the different sort of traditions, different views develop. So one view, the Sanskrit word charvaka, this nihilism, denying God, next life, or spirituality, just this life. So rest of the Indian spiritual thought criticize that, even condemn that. But the person who hold, who holding that Charvaka view refer Rishi. So sage, respect. So that is the, uh, he mentioned to me, that is the Indian tradition. So therefore, now this country, uh, beside homegrown religions, like different sort of uh, Hinduism, like the uh, Sangya philosophy, and some other sort of uh, ancient Hindu philosophy. Uh, then later, Buddhism, Jainism, uh, and then later, Sikhism, these homegrown religion. Uh, then from outside, Zorazuddin came to this country. Now today, the Parsi community who practice Sarazuddin, very small community in Bombay, almost handful. <laughs> but they sort of, they are very happy. They settle here, no fear, happily settle here. From small community, they made contribution for this country I think in many fields, like Tata, as far as I know, uh, a Parsi, and late or uh, the field marshal, Manikshaw, also Parsi, like that. So, and then also Christian, Christianity come here, settled. Muslim come here, settled. So I think India is the only country where all major world religious traditions live together. 
of course, occasionally, some problems here and there. That's understandable. Uh, over a billion human beings sort of community, some mischievous people are always there. That's understandable. But overall, India, I think, still practicing ahimsa as well as religious harmony. So now, I want to tell, I want to share with you, my Indian friends, you must realize uh, this thousand-year-old India's treasure, this is not only just ancient culture or ancient way of life, but also very, very relevant to today's world. When I saw, you see, conflict between Catholic and Protestant, in, particularly in Northern Ireland, and also some Muslim country between Shia and Sunni, uh, even killing. When I saw these things, I really admire the India's thousand-year-old ahimsa and religious harmony. So this, whether materialized from prayer or not, I don't know. In any way, today's world, India still practicing these things. Now that you must realize, there's India's treasure. You can make some contribution for the rest of the world. Yes, religious, different religious, different religious tradition can live together on the basis of mutual admiration, mutual respect. So I think we Indian, I think must tell, show the world. And then ahimsa. Ahimsa, nonviolence, very important because peace will not come just from Harsede in the form of blessing from above. No. Peace we must create by ourselves. So the conflict, war, violence, Actually, our human creation. Of course, the, the nature element also sometimes, uh, or say they acting like violence, like flood, or or say this earthquake, these things. But that is beyond our control. But some kind of human act, some or say major portion of our problem, which we today facing, many of them our own creation. So logically, those problems which created essentially by human, human ourselves, we must have potential to reduce this problem, to eliminate this problem. Therefore, since the violence also kind of action, the non-violence also kind of action, so I often, you see, telling people, now, 20th century, very important century in human history, but that century more or less becomes a century of bloodshed, according to some historian. In 20th century, more than 200 million of people killed through violence. So, the, and still, problem still there. I think many problems which we are facing at the beginning of the 21st century, many problems, the traces of previous century sort of wrong or the method, and also negligence about inner peace. 20th century, 19th century, I think people too much excited about science and technology, and we just sort of believe science and technology, material values bring peace. That fail. Now, peace come from within. For genuine peace must come through inner peace. Therefore, first, if we want real peace, we must look inward, create inner peace, create the happy thought. Then science and technology also become disposal of peaceful thought. Science and technology become disposable of hatred. They're like the 
September 11 event. Those people who plan these things, their mind is concerned, very intelligent, very smart. But their intelligence, their sort of what's the, uh, and then science and technology, guided by hatred. So that disaster is happening. So therefore, we only, you see, also the relying just the science and technology and the material value. I think uh, this century uh, may become like previous century. So therefore, now we must make every effort for all levels, not only government level or, or leaders level, but ourselves, people's level, particularly our younger generation. Uh, we must have clear vision. This 21st century should be a century of dialogue. Whenever we face some differences and conf potential of conflict, we must solve that through a human way. Talk, listen, their sort of or say the reasons, their interest, and try to find some kind of compromise. That's the only way. I think concept of war based on a view, we, uh, we should be victory, others should defeat. One side victory, one side defeat. That's the old fashion of thinking. Uh, today's world, because of ecology, because of global economy, and now the, every nation, every continent heavily interdependent. According to that new reality, constant war is outdated. Destruction of your neighbor who created little problems, little inconvenience, but actually part of yourself. So destruction of your neighbor is destruction of yourself. So we should consider entire world, entire humanity as a part of we. India needs your neighboring states. Asia need Arab, Africa, America. America also need Asia, Arab. That's the reality. So therefore, now the strong sort of demarcation, we and they, and on that basis, you see the concept of violence, and destruction of your, our, our enemy, that's outdated. Thinking these, I mean, analyze this reality, then you can develop certain conviction. Now violence is no way to solve, only through talk, through dialogue. So this century, we should make every effort to bring this century, century of dialogue. In that respect, India's thousand-year-old tradition, tradition of ahimsa, tradition of religious harmony, is very relevant. And meantime, meantime, I myself consider as a messenger of ancient Indian sort of thought. So wherever I go, I always talk these two things. Ahimsa, based on karuna, that's my number one sort of what's the talk, uh, number one sort of what's the commitment. Number two, religious, promotion of religious harmony. So these are India's. I mean, these, 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 things, these thoughts not come from my sort of brain, but I learned from India's tradition. So while I really feel proud acting like a messenger of India, uh, but at the same time, when I saw, uh, is this is some still backward thinking within the country, caste system or some kind of little discrimination. I think these we must address very seriously. Uh, so now today, I think some of the sort of what's the problems, you see, due to these uh, backward thinking, that also sometimes involves some political sort of what's the uh, problems. 
So therefore, we must address some problem which can describe part of our tradition, but actually outdated and backward thinking. These we must remove. Recently, I was in Rishikishi and with many Indian sort of spiritual leaders and some sadhus, I told them, I'm really proud to be like messenger of this country. But within the country, still some backward things there, backward thinking, backward habit. These we must change, we must address. So that I want to share with my Indian friend. So, India, as far as thought is concerned, last, I think, three, four, five thousand years, I think most sophisticated philosophy, sophisticated thought, you see, develop in this country. And sometimes I jokingly telling my Northern Indian friend, of course, I also live in Northern India, but sometimes I jokingly telling them, the South Indian brain is something very special. <laughs> Look, see, at least, you see, the, in the past, sort of these masters who developed, you see, new sort of views, new thinking, most of them come from South India. So usually I, uh, I tease my Indian, Northern Indian friend, you see, as far as the brain is concerned, South Indian brain is more smart. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> this is not a scientific sort of today, a finding, <laughs> but simply I just you see, mentioned, uh, I just thought like that. So in any way, that's what I want to, to share with you. Please, Indian, uh, about this inner development is concerned, you must feel proud. Uh, and meantime, bring Western, Western science and technology, now already now much developed here, combination, inner spiritual values, that also realistic, not orthodox way, realistic. Uh, and the Western sort of economy development, material development combined, then you will be really uh, create happy thought. Thank you.